Hello, my name is Samantha Perry, and right now I'll be talking to you about charge-induced force noise modeling for the LISA charge management system. So just a brief overview as to what LISA's gravitational reference sensor is composed of. Um, it consists of a test mass, which acts as the endpoints for the interferometry measurement. The test mass acts as well as a position anchor um, and enables drag-free control via the LISA's microthrusters. It's composed of a gold platinum alloy, which is dense and non-magnetic. It's shielded from disturbances through its housing, which is composed of a capacitance electrodes, which you can see here in the graphic in silver, silver color. Um, these electrodes are used for injection, sensing, and actuation of the test mass. Um, so injection, injecting voltages, sensing its position, and moving the test mass if need be. Everything is coated in gold, which is for um, its homogeneous electrostatics properties, as well as a nice and even reflection surface. So a brief overview as to why we even need a charge management system. Well, um, due to the space environment, there are cosmic rays and also some solar energetic particles that if left to build up on the test mass will produce um, some forces, some charge induced forces. So we have as you may know, Lorentz and Coulomb forces due to charges. Um, Lorentz forces for this case are negligible, but the Coulomb forces are non-negligible. So when we, the noisy environment deposits charge onto uh, the LISA spacecraft, some charges do pass through and land on the test mass. Um, if there is an existing electric field, what will happen is the test mass will begin to move um, due to this existing field and due to its own charge. And uh, if we here we take the Coulomb law equation and we break it up into both the charge Q and the noisy um, uh, net potential field, this delta X term um, is composed of both the DC and the noise term. And if you multiply this all out into the Coulomb law, um, the main concern is these two terms here where we have um, a varying noisy term that's frequency dependent, multiplying and increasing in magnitude due to a growing DC term, that's what creates these large in-band frequency contributions, and this is bad for the performance of LISA. So this occurs at potential starting at about plus or minus 70 millivolts for the test mass potential. So how do we get rid of these um, forces? Uh, how do we get rid of charge is the, with the photoelectric effect, which is a contact-free method of discharge, in which we shine light on the metallic surfaces um, with photons that have enough energy to eject electrons from the surface. So when you shine light on a gold coated surface, you need um, a work function that will um, be able to overcome the amount of energy it needs to eject electrons. So for gold surfaces, a pure gold surface, this happens anything lower than 289 nanometers, which makes UV light a perfect candidate for this operation. So uh, there are many different proposed charge control modes, but just to briefly give you an overview as to what they are, we have um, pulsed modes and we have um, continuous or DC modes where either the light is pulsed or it's shining continuously. And there's two different ways that we can control this light. We can either do it intermittently where we let the charge, as you can see in this graphic, slowly increase to what the maximum requirement is, plus 70 millivolts. And then we shine a large amount of light in a short period of time to bring the charge down quickly again. This is the primary method used on Lisa Pathfinder. The continuous modes, as you can see in this graphic, is rather keeping the chest mesh charge at its equilibrium point of zero volts, volts using applied voltages or the phase of the UV light to access that perfect voltage and coupled with all of the surface properties of the GRS to keep the test mass voltage at zero. And so for this operation, you need to shine a significantly less amount of light. As you can see here, we have a compared two nanowatts of um, power in this continuous method versus the 125 nanowatts in the intermittent method for pulsed. So these modes imply both the CMS requirements, specifically the amount of UV power that we need and the lifetime of these UV LEDs. And it also very strongly implies the performance of LISA. And that's what I'll be talking about. 
So we want to make a, a charge management system dynamics model in order to derive realistic performance requirements, but also to understand how this CMS will work in space with both simulation and ground experimental results. So how this model has been developed is to start with the torsion pendulum apparent yield curve, which here we're using the data from the pendulum at the University of Trento, which has a GRS in its pendulum that's very similar to what is planned to be used on LISA. Um, and we use the curve with no applied voltages, which is the blue curve. And we add all noise sources, um, such as environmental rate and its associated noise, its um, pulse phase and pulse phase noise, UV power magnitude, and the, the jitter in UV power magnitude, that's consequently there. And we differentiate all of this these factors in the function to get what the test mesh charge is at a given time. Then we take the amplitude spectral density of this time domain test mesh charge and validate that the noise remains below the requirement. So here you can see the requirement um, of basically the budget of what the lease emission has given our team um, to that we need to have our system remain below this requirement. So in order to make this model possible, we have some key equations. Um, we have a, an equation to model this S-curve so we can know what the apparent yield is at any given time, which is the amount of electrons that um, a surface uh, that will be moving from surfaces given um, a what the test mass potential is. And if we take a, the linear approximation of this curve um, close to zero in terms of charge, we're left with the following expression. We can solve this ordinary differential equation in order to understand things in the time domain. Um, uh, so that's what all of these equations are here. If the environment was added, we can also add this in. Um, the environment um, contributes to the net um, you know, charge of the test mass, so we need to factor that in. So um, the main takeaways from here is that over time, the UV power will, will charge, cause the charge to decay to zero at a rate dependent of what the power P is, and as UV power increases, the contribution of the noisy environment decreases, so it brings this um, R environment down. So here's some key, some more equations um, to understand how um, we're contributing force noise on the test mass um, that could pollute the least um, measurement, um, and it's given by this Coulomb law equation here. And if we take the amplitude spectral density of both charge and the net potential field differences, delta x, um, we get these two amplitude spectral densities. Now note that this looks a lot like um, the equation that I multiplied out with the DC term times the noisy field. Um, so that's what these amplitude spectral densities are just in the frequency domain. Um, and these, these terms of Q are in a function, are a function of UV power so if we change the power, we can cause these um, contributions, these noise contributions to stay down. So the model uses um, a numerical method and um, it calculates everything in the time domain and then converts it to the frequency domain. So here are some results um, from some preliminary results from our model. Right now, um, this is a very generic discharging case that we may very well see on LISA. We have an initial test mass potential of 70 millivolts, which is right at the upper limit. And we want the final test mass potential to go down to an equilibrium point of zero millivolts. So you can see here, this graph on the left is bringing the test mass potential down from 70 millivolts down to zero volts in at the time scale of um, approximately two days. And their phase was adjusted to achieve this desired equilibrium point at zero at 200 one degrees relative to the 100 kilohertz injection signal, which you can see here in this graph. Um, and we see here in the amplitude spectral densities in comparison with the requirements that the noise stays below the least of requirement. So the light blue curve is the assumed approximate uh, allocation of what um, anything related to noise related to charge is going to do. So you can see that in the result in the dark blue. And the sum of all of the of the acceleration noise is seen in the green. So you can see that this green curve remains below the electrostatics noise allocation, which is the yellow curve, um, which all stays well below the least requirement, which is the black curve. Everything, all electronics need to stay below the black curve, but our contribution needs to stay below the yellow curve. And you can see that with this um, 
phase controlled charge control, we can keep it well below that requirement. Okay, so let's look at both the continuous and the intermittent cases. Um, for a continuous case, we um, will let the charge slowly increase up to about approximately 70 millivolts. And then in a matter of just here, we are talking about an hour and a half of letting the charge go all the way back down to minus 70 millivolts and then um, stopping all shining of UV light. So that's the first case, the intermittent case. And the continuous case is where we're trying to keep the test mass voltage uh, potential as close to zero as we possibly can. So here we see some jitter that um, is a function of the environment shot noise and the UV power shot noise. Um, and you can see it stays well below in the um, tens of micro volts range. Um, so the first intermittent case is from Lisa Pathfind Heritage. And this trying to keep the test mass potential very close to zero is a novel method. So let's see how these look in terms of the noise that they contribute. So um, here uh, in this graph, you see the green curve is the result of the intermittent discharge, and the red curve is the result of the continuous discharge. Um, the light blue and the yellow curves are showing what the noise contribution is when we're getting close to the limits of test mass um, charge at 70 millivolts and minus 70 millivolts. So you can see the reason why that's the requirement is because it keeps the noise just below the least requirement at the plus or minus 70 millivolts. However, when we shine all that light in at, at once and we make the charge change really quickly, it causes the noise contribution of the CMS to go above our noise allocation, which has made Lisa Pathfinder have to stop the science measurement. But with the new continuous mode of phase controlled light, you can see that although we're, we're, we're controlling the charge and we're keeping it well below the noise requirement. So as you can see, this intermittent discharge produces noise that's above the requirement and the continuous discharge is a much more ro robust method as proven by our model. Um, another case that Lisa Pathfinder might see is um, how it deals with the flux in environment. How well does continuous discharge deal with keeping the test mass um, voltage at zero, even if the environment changes. So here in the simulation, we give it a burst of 100 electrons per second for approximately 14 hours. Um, and you can see here in uh, the test mass potential over time that uh, once the environment rate increases from, the nominal requirement is 25 electrons per second, but it's assumed that there may be some events that cause the environment to, rate to increase up to 100 electrons per second. So as we see here, the environment increases for a period of time up to 100 electrons per second. So the charge does change. Um, again, we're in the tens of millivolts um, range. And uh, then it, it um, slowly decreases back down to zero at when the event stops. And here we see what the noise contribution is. Um, and you can see that the noise stays low. It stays below this, this yellow curve, um, well below it. And um, that is great news. So we can see that even with changes in environment flux, the potential of the test mass will change, but the noise contribution still stays below the requirement. So to conclude, we're building up tools to validate charge control modes, to simulate different things that the CMS might need to see in space. Um, pulse mode and continuous modes are advantageous for more advanced methods and low noise charge control, as seen by the amplitude spectral densities results. Um, the numerical model reflects true results that we see the system performs below the requirement in pulse mode. Um, continuous modes are performing better than the intermittent modes, and that the system can handle changes in environment rate. In the future, we hope to do a lot of very interesting things with this model. We hope to look at below band environment noise fluctuation at the th around 30 days time frame to see if it those lower frequencies can also stay below the requirement. Um, we also want to validate charge management system requirements um, with the system. We also want to match the model results to experimental data with um, the University of Florida's torsion pendulum that we have. And we also would like to use noise measurements that we are taking from the TRL-5 charge management device um, and put it into our numerical model to see the, the um, UV light system that we're building and the performance of it, will it also contribute to these low noises? Can it perform at the rate that we need to to keep the charge noise as low as possible? 
So with that, I thank you for your time and I look forward to hearing um, your questions and comments below. Thank you.